All right, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good morning. Good morning. Cool. All right, well, welcome to CSE 224, Section B, um, Fall 2020. So this is the first of a four-course computer science sequence. Um, and if you're a computer science student at Clark and you're looking to transfer to a university, particularly WSUV, um, you'll be taking all four of these computer science courses. Um, starting with 224, which is uh, Unix programming and tools. Um, the sequel to this is 222 data structures in C, which is winter. And then in spring, there's 223, which is advanced data structures in Java. And the fourth course is CSE 215, that's a discrete structures course. And people take that either in um, fall or winter. And that course is filled up for fall right now, I believe. Um, but if you're not taking it right now, take it in winter um, for sure. So, um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Some people are still coming in. But, um, but we'll go ahead and get started. And we're going to largely be doing kind of like, you know, getting up to speed stuff <clears throat> for this first class. Um, so my name's Nick. Um, I teach all four of these CS courses. I also do 250 and 270 in spring and summer. Um, and I teach um, a section of Engineering Computer Science 101. So some of you have had me before in other classes, some of you haven't. Um, nice to meet all of you anyway. Um, and let's um, let's run through Canvas and start from there. All right, so um, so we meet every day from 11 o'clock to 11.50 um, online, obviously. Um, this is not an online class in the usual sense of, um, you know, download the material and do the work at your own pace. Um, this is a remote class. So it's basically a face-to-face, in-person class where you would go in to room 155 and sit down every day from 11 to 11.50, and we would lecture and talk. Um, it's remote because we're doing that through an online um, interface, Zoom in this case. Um, but the, the class still meets five days a week, and the expectation is that you're going to come to each class and participate as opposed to, you know, just recording the, the lecture and then listening to it later. So everybody who's here already has uh, the Zoom meeting info, presumably. Um, Otherwise, you wouldn't you wouldn't be here listening to this. Um, I'm doing things a little differently from how I did them in spring and in summer. Um, I'm trying to make this a little bit more interactive, give more chance for some back and forth during the lecture and so on and so forth. So I'm experimenting with some new things that I've put together, um, and I hope to make better use of of the chat feature in Zoom. Um, but also some tools that I'm putting together. Let me do a quick um, quick uh, check on everybody here. Um, go ahead and send a message to the chat window. You can send it to everybody if you like, um, and just let me know that you're there. Um, cool. Awesome. Cool, we have lots of people, which also means my microphone is working, so that's bonus. So I'm not recording through Zoom because the, the school doesn't have a lot of, of space available, um, but I record all of my lectures and I post them on YouTube. Okay, so those will be available shortly after each lecture. Um, and I'm also trying to index those this year so they'll be searchable um, by topic. So, um, so yeah, the lectures will be recorded and posted, which means you don't need to write down everything that I say. You don't need to scramble to, um, 
to record you know every line of code that I write on paper or everything that I type you'll be able to go back and see these in the videos my hope is that you can spend class time actually thinking about what we're talking about thinking about the material and the concepts and um, and asking questions and you know really engaging with with the subject matter during class um, the the less efficient alternative is to go from the lecture you know um, and a few hours later watch the recording and try to understand what was going on because if it's not clicking then there's no one you can ask a question to. well there's no way you can ask me a question right um, you really want to do that during class time so try to spend the time here 11 o'clock to 11:50 every day really thinking about the material and asking questions when they come up and and playing what ifs in your head and so on and so forth All right, um, my office hours are um, posted on the usual place where they've been forever, which is engrcs.com um, slash schedule, but you can also find them here. So Monday's 7 to 9, Wednesday's 5 to 7, Friday's 2 to 3. Different meeting code for office hours. Okay, the code you used right now is just for this section of 224. If you want to catch me in office hours, use this code. And um, that Zoom room has a waiting room enabled, which means if I'm currently talking to somebody else, um, when you connect to that, it'll say waiting for the meeting host to let you in. Okay. You might sit there for like 45 minutes, depending on how many people are ahead of you. And it may not look like anything's happening. Now, usually when people come in, I'll try to send a note. Or when I start with somebody else, I'll send a note to everybody in the waiting room and say, hey, there's three people waiting. I'll get to you as soon as I can. Um, but you might need to be patient. So, so if you're looking for me in office hours, plan on you know having something else to do. Turn on your sound so when I let you into the room, you know, um, and so on and so forth. Um, all right, so that's office hours, and and the other site, um, engrcs.com/schedule. This is the same one you get from advising when they um, tell you to talk to a faculty advisor. It's got hours for myself, Izad, Carol, and Tina. And if you click through on my hours, you'll see Zoom info. And if you go to more details, you'll get a clickable link. Same thing that's already in Canvas. All right, let me run through the syllabus um, pretty quickly. So, um, CSE 224, so programming tools. Um, this is a course that covers a bunch of different things. It's really a, a sort of, um, I don't want to say a hodgepodge, but it's really a, a collection of, of different things that you want to get nailed down to be able to do the other courses, 222, 223, and to be able to move on to, to a university and a job, right, and work effectively in your, your computer environment. So you can read the course description yourself, but, but basically the idea is, right, as computer scientists, we spend a lot of time working with computers. Okay, that's going to be, you know, where, where we spend most of our day and, you know, sometimes a good chunk of our nights. Um, Writing code, debugging code, doing collaboration with other people, documenting code, right? All that stuff happens on computers. Um, and, you know, that's, that's more and more the case for a lot of people who aren't computer scientists, right? If you're a writer, if, if you're a business person, you spend your time working with computers. The difference is um, if you're a business person, if you're an accountant, for example... And, you know, you're doing spreadsheets for your customers and, and things like that. Um, you're using, you know, a set of tools in your computer. You're using QuickBooks or whatever um, and Word documents to, you know, create paperwork and so on and so forth. Um, you're using a, a set of tools, but they're very fixed, right? Um, they've, been, they've been given to you and you chose, you know, do I want Quicken or do I want this tool or that tool and so on. Computer scientists, we need to use a lot of tools, 
okay we need to do a lot of different things and these things change over time um, and our toolbox gets really really big but we want to use our toolbox we don't want somebody else's toolbox okay um, and let me give you an example, right? I want to hang a picture on the wall, so I need to put a nail in the wall. So I go to my toolbox and I get a hammer, okay? Um, and I hammer the nail into the wall and I put my tool away and I go on with my life. That's a good tool, okay? That's an efficient scenario of, of tool use. Um, you know, when I got the hammer, it was kind of slippery and so I wrapped this electrical tape around the handle so that I could get a better grip on it. That tape is still there, that tape still works. Okay, it's good tool use. Suppose I, I go to get my hammer out of the toolkit and it tells me I need to upgrade it, right? I need to, to go through some step to get the new version of the hammer. And the new version of the hammer doesn't have the electrical tape on it. And it takes 20 minutes to download. And then I have to put electrical tape on it. And, and now the hammer has you know a handle that's five inches longer and every time I try to use it to hit a nail, I'm putting holes in the wall, right? This would be horrible. That would be a terrifying life, right? Um, that's what our computers do to us, right? You learn how to use a word processor, you're all happy, and you come back one day, and you have to upgrade it, and it's a different machine. It, it has things in different places, and, and you do things differently, and things that worked yesterday don't work today. That's terrible, okay? We're not going to do that. We're going to learn how to make our programming environment our own. We're going to make our own tools. We're going to learn how to use tools and customize them and create a toolkit that works for us. Okay, so that's one goal of this course. And this is one reason we're working exclusively in Unix because Unix is, is and always has been very much geared towards that mindset. Okay, so, so tool collecting, tool customizing, tool building is a big part of this course. The course is also about programming right because we make tools by programming them um, it's also about C it's it's a bit of a bridge course between CSE 121 your your prerequisite programming course and CSE 222 where we get into data structures and lots of low-level programming in C so we'll do a lot of C programming we'll, we'll do a lot of programming in the shell um, shell scripting um, and we'll talk about a lot of higher level concepts like processes um, and file systems and things like that. We'll spend a lot of time talking about debugging. When you write a C program and it doesn't work, what do you do? Well, maybe you stare at the code and hope you can see what the problem is. Maybe you delete it and start writing it again from scratch. Maybe you give up, right? Another option is to run a debugger. And a debugger will basically let you run your program, but watch what's happening inside the computer as the program runs. And so when you get to the line where it should be printing something out and it doesn't, you can say, huh, well, if this variable was equal to 5, it should be printing this. What's the value of this variable? And you look, and the value is 0. And you can say, well, why didn't it get set to 5? And you can go through your code and see what's happening while it runs. Okay, that's a typical debugger. If you've done Engineering 270, we use a debugger in there. So we'll learn about the debugger for C, which is GDB, the GNU debugger. We'll learn about a bunch of other tools, things like make files um, for efficiently compiling programs. We'll learn about source code control, so we're going to use Git heavily in this class. Um, and there's all sorts of benefits to Git. We'll get into that in about a week and uh, talk about the details of it. So it's basically all these different things related to, um, to living and working in a Unix environment. So it's all, it's all good stuff that will hopefully serve you for a long time. Um, so my name is Nick Macias. The way to reach me online, nmacias at clark.edu. Send me an email, preferably a plain text email, um, to nmacias at clark.edu. Try not to email me through Canvas if you want a quick reply, especially if you're sending attachments. Okay, if you send me an attachment in Canvas, I have to get to a computer, I have to log into Canvas, I have to open your message, I have to download the attachment, and then I have to open it in some other program. That's not going to happen very quickly. If you shoot me an email um, to nmacias at clark.edu, my phone beeps, I get the message right then, and I can respond immediately if it's something urgent or um, as soon as possible. 
Um, the text for the course is, is this book called the Linux Command Line. It's a free PDF download. Um, it's not magic. Okay, I'm not assigning homework questions from it. I'm not going to ask you, you know, what's on page 72 of your textbook. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a good reference for Linux. It covers a lot of different aspects of Linux and things we're going to be doing, shell programming in particular. Um, it's, it's a good PDF to keep on hand. But if you have your favorite Linux book already, that should be fine. Um, I mentioned the C primer in here. It's, it's your book from 121. That's always useful to have. But again, any, any decent C book will work. And there's tons of, of open source versions of, uh, of C books. Tentative schedule doesn't always work. Um, tentative schedule doesn't always um, last very long. But just kind of an idea where we're going. We're going to start off talking about Unix and, and this idea of working in a Unix environment, making the environment our own, and so on and so forth. Um, we'll start talking about shell scripting, writing programs in Linux. Um, we're definitely going to review VI because I want you using VI in this class. And we're going to talk about working from the command line. Okay? I want you working on the command line. I do not want you using code blocks or Visual Studio or things like that. The closer you are to the metal, the better your experience is going to be. Okay, um, you should probably not have to use your mouse much in this class, right? Everything can be done from the keyboard. Um, this this sounds old school in some ways, and in some ways it is, but this is more efficient. Okay, um, and I won't I won't make blanket statements in general because somebody who's really good at using an IDE and really knows how to how to work with it can probably be more efficient than than someone on a command line um, unless they're really good right and then you get into like competitions um, but in general right the less you have to point and click the less you have to hunt around for something on your screen and control a mouse and the more you can you can type commands at the keyboard the faster you're gonna be okay all things being equal um, and the more flexible you're going to be, if you find yourself on another system, you probably always are going to have command line access. You may not have the latest version of IntelliJ that you're used to, right? Um, so start with, with the command line, start with VI, and then, you know, when you're on the job and you're told you have to use such and such, you can, you can build up from there, right? But going the other direction is a lot harder, so I'd rather you learn it. From the uh, from the ground up. All right, so so um, we'll get into some shell programming. We're getting to C programming. Some uh, some refresher on VI. We'll talk about algorithms like file systems and and modularization of code and so on and so forth. And by week five, we'll probably be way off this track. But some of the things that we're going to go over, right? Input and output, um, passing arguments to C programs, debugger. I already mentioned. Uh, regular expressions for searching um, and replacing patterns in files. This is also a VI thing. Um, creating graphical interfaces. So we'll play around with dialogue probably and make some some GUIs um, that that will inter interact with Bash scripts. Um, text processing, things like awk and sed, um, and so on and so forth. So we'll be covering a lot of different stuff. Um, course outcomes you can read on your own. These are the the hit points that um, we're going to try to guarantee you um, become proficient in so that you can move on to other courses that depend on this one. So CSE 222 here at Clark, but also the, the third year programming courses at WSUV require CSE 224. These are some of the things that... that um, some of the reasons why they require that are, are these outcomes here. So you can come back and look at those. All right, um, assessment. So how does your grade come out in this course? 25% of your grade is based on homework. And that's a combination of, you know, maybe short homework assignments, like homework one that's already posted that we'll go over in a bit, um, or the longer term programming assignments, one or two weeks each. Um, all that combines into 25%. One day programs we'll talk about probably next week. These are our quick turnaround 24 hour assignments. Um, I'll post them at eight in the morning. They'll be due at eight o'clock the following morning. 
and they're submitted online, they're graded automatically, and they're really, they're really checkpoints. Um, we'll talk about how to pass a command line argument to a function in C, and then you'll see a one-day programming assignment that asks you to write a piece of code to do that. And the way one-day one programs work is if you understand the concept that the ODP is testing, it might take you five minutes to do the code. Right? So you write the code, you send it in the assessment system, you get your 10 out of 10 back from the system, and you're good to go. But if there's something you don't understand, if you thought you knew how to use this function but you really don't, you'll run it into the system and you get back 5 out of 10, say. And it tells you, oh, okay, I need to figure out you know, how to use scanf. And that's the time to figure it out because it's probably something we're going to use the next day in class. So it's a chance to sort of keep yourself on track and, and confirm that you really do understand the things that you think you understand. So we'll talk about those probably next week. I'll start posting some, um, but that's 10% that's, um, of your grade. Um, attendance and class participation, I've got that set to 0% for now. As long as people come to class and participate, I won't, I won't record this as an element of your grade. If, participation, if attendance drops down below 90%, then I'll start um, recording attendance, and that'll factor into your grade accordingly, probably 5 or 10%. Uh, midterm, 25% of your grade. Final, 35% of your grade. So those are the biggest components. And then um, service learning project we have to talk about next week, but that's probably 5%. That might go away. I haven't decided. But that's a piece of a longer-term, um, three-quarter length project um, that you work on in 224, 22, and 23. Um, and we'll talk about details for that once I decide what I want to do with it. Course policies, you can read through these, but, but basically, right, make sure the work you turn in is your own. We'll talk more about this when we start doing the first long programming assignment, but um, do your own work, okay? Don't turn in somebody else's code. Don't look at other code and modify it um, and turn it in as your own. Um, absolutely don't, you know, pay somebody to write your code for you. Um, those are all versions of, of plagiarism. The bigger challenge in this, this area is, um, it can be a slippery line, right? I, I encourage people to work with one another to talk to one another, to try to learn this material together, to share ideas, and so on and so forth. But when you're doing that while working on a programming assignment, it can start to get into a bit of a gray area, right? If you're having a hard time understanding some concept and your friend shows you some code to explain it to you, that's probably okay by itself. But if that code ends up in your program, Right then, we're starting to get into an area where it might be considered plagiarism. So we'll we'll talk more about this when we get into the first long assignment. Um, late papers and late assignments. So um, I need stuff turned in by the due date, and due dates are usually generous enough that you should have plenty of time to do your assignments if you start early. The only times I found people get into trouble on this is when they think that they can do this assignment in a day and the two-week assignment gets started the day before it's due, and they find out, oh, this is more complicated than I thought, right? So, so the way to avoid that is to start your stuff early. And if you start your stuff the day that it's assigned, and you don't think you can get it done in time, right? Come and talk to me that day. Don't talk to me two weeks later on the due date. Um, talk to me along the way, right? But, but you've got to start the stuff early, okay? Um, don't miss your exams if you can help it, because um, that's, that's a whole complication to make a different exam and, and grade it fairly and so on and so forth. So plan on making your exams um, being there on time for each one. Um, computer equipment misuse, this is pretty obvious, but don't, don't deliberately mess up the, uh, the Linux server, the Zoom session, things like that, right? It's really easy to do denial of service attacks. It's really easy to um, take advantage of the openness of an environment and use it to, you know, make life difficult for other people. Don't do that, right? I don't think that's a problem for anybody here. 
Um, the Linux server we're using is open in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of the stuff is readable to the public, um, you know, to the general users, you, um, not the public at large. Um, and that's intentional, right? It's, it's, there's things you can learn there, but it, it does expose some vulnerabilities. So, you know, don't try to fill up the file system or, or make a fork bomb or things like that. Um, we'll talk about those later. All right, support services. Um, this I want to go through in detail. Um, basically, the goal here in this class and at the college is, is to help you succeed, right? My, my goal in teaching is to help you succeed at whatever it is you're trying to do. If you're trying to transfer to your university, if you're trying to get out and get a job, if you're just trying to understand stuff better so you can write games, right? I'm here to help you succeed. That's, that's why I do this. Um, and the college has the same attitude, right? The college is here as a resource to you in your journey. Um, different people need different things to be successful, right? Some people need um, more time on a test, right? Maybe they have test-taking anxiety, and in a 50-minute exam, they spend the first 40 minutes trying to calm down enough to be able to remember what they know about C programming, right? Um, someone like that can talk to the Disability Support Services Office, DSS, and explain the situation and you can work with somebody there and document this this um this aspect of your learning and you can get you know um permission to have say extended testing time time and a half to double time something like that um if we're in the classroom in person right some people need a low distraction environment they can't concentrate when somebody next to them is you know erasing their answers all the time and so on they can arrange a test in a low distraction environment um, or have a note taker because they can't see the board um, or things like that. So if you feel like an accommodation would help you, um, lots of contact information for DSS, website, email, phone numbers. If you go to their uh, website, they probably have Zoom information and you can always talk to me. Okay. The goal is we don't want you to spend your time trying to, you know, make up for the fact that you have test anxiety or, or you have difficulty reading, um, you know, tiny print or something like that. We want you to concentrate on, you know, learning programming tools in this case. All right. Um, College-wide policy. So this is, this is pretty much the only thing I'll read from a slide in this course um, is the non-discrimination policy. But I like to read this once in each course just to make sure everybody has heard it. Um, it's a little bit less of an issue being online instead of in person, but it can still be an issue online. So, um, so I'll, I'll just read this verbatim for you. Um, Non-discrimination policy. Clark College affirms a commitment to freedom from discrimination for all members of the college community. The college expressly prohibits discrimination against any person on the basis of race, color, national origin, disabled veteran status, sex, sexual orientation, age, gender identity, creed, gender expression, Vietnam era veteran status, religion, marital status, or presence of physical, sensory, or mental disability. The responsibility for and the protection of this commitment extends to students, faculty, administration, staff, contractors, and those who develop or participate in college programs. It encompasses every aspect of employment and every student community activity. So hopefully that's that's self-explanatory. My my one sentence version of that would be treat people decently and expect to be treated decently in return, right? Um, don't harass people. Um, if if you're thinking of sharing something, think about um, is this something that is appropriate, you know, to share with everybody. Um, or should I hold back on it? Um, if you encounter any situations with this, come and talk to me, talk to somebody, right? If you encounter this in a different class, you can talk to, to a teacher who's not, you know, teaching that class. Um, anybody at the college basically knows about this and takes it very, very seriously. So, um, and I've, I've only had, you know, something like this come up, I think once in the about 10 years I've been teaching here at Clark. Um, 
So it's it's generally not something that seems to happen a lot, but if it does happen, definitely um, come and talk to me about it. All right, you can read the Code of Student Conduct here. Um, additional information. Um, keys to success. So, so just some things to keep in mind that, that might help you be more successful. Um, plan on coming to every class on time, staying for the whole class. Okay, and come prepared to, to try to learn the material and engage with the material as opposed to, um, you know, just taking notes and then I'll think about what we said later on. Um, don't be afraid to use your computer to answer questions. Okay, I'll have students who, who send me emails saying, you know how when we write a C program, we say number sign include stdio.h. What happens if we don't do that, right? And my answer is almost always, let's try it and find out, right? You can write a hello world without that number sign include and compile it and run it and see what happens, right? A lot of the things that you want to know, the answers are inside the computer itself. And it can be a great resource, right? This was how I learned computers was, was by, you know, using a computer, taking it apart, putting it together, breaking it, trying to fix it. Um, so, so don't be afraid of that. Um, get to know other students in the class, okay? Um, there's a Discord server. I'll show you the link for that in a minute. But um, talking to other students, kicking around ideas, um, letting off steam, all of these things, this will help, okay? Um, when I was in school, there were about four or five of us that, that were going through the program together, and we would just always work together. Um, somebody figured something out, they would show it to the others, and then you would try to come up with something, you know, even more clever. Um, or if you were stuck on something, you could say, you know, I don't get what to do about this. And, and you know, if, if your friend is just handing you code saying, here, just turn this in, that's obviously not, not what you want, right? But sometimes a friend who you've been working with can explain something better to you than I can, right? Everybody has their own things that they'll respond to, their own ways of learning. Um, and, you know, having a group of peers that you can bounce questions off of or offer answers to can be really powerful. So get to know other people in the class, make study groups, so on and so forth. Um, keep up with the course, okay? This course in particular builds very solidly on previous week's material. So if you don't understand the week one material, by week three you're going to be in trouble. Okay, if if you don't know how to compile a C program, all the stuff that we're doing where I expect you to be making test C code is is not going to to mean anything to you, right? Because you haven't been able to follow it along. So so try not to fall behind. And if you feel like you're starting to fall behind, talk to me, right? If there's something foundational that that you're missing, ask me. Right? I don't know how to compile a C program. That's a totally legitimate question. I don't care that you took CSE 121 and you were supposed to learn it there. If you don't know how to compile a C program, send me a note and let me know, and we'll talk about it. Right? If you don't know what C is, if you don't know what Bash is, if you don't understand what PuTTY is, ask me. Okay? Um, I'm, I'm not here to judge you or make you feel uncomfortable or, or tell you what you should or should not know. I'm here to help you learn what you need to, to know to move forward. Okay, so don't ever hesitate to, to ask me questions. Um, I probably won't cancel class even if it snows like 20 feet tomorrow. Um, but, you know, Clark website, all sorts of good information. And as things change with COVID and so on, good place to check in. Um, we're online for all of fall. As far as I know, we're online for all of winter also, at least my courses. Um, so we'll be doing Zoom for, you know, the next number of months. So we'll get good at this. Um, and then courses on the ECS website, um, course policies on the ECS website, including grading, um, letter grades, and so on and so forth. All right, any questions on all of that stuff? That's just kind of like syllabus details. All right, um, I'll let you look at the additional course policies. This has things like um, specific to this section, so more keys to success, um, 
information about the Discord server, which we'll talk about in a second, getting Linux access, there's a video for installing Linux on your system, and a lot of stuff that I just already talked about. So I'm not going to go through that in a lot of detail right now. Um, link to the Linux text on here also, as well as the syllabus. Link to lecture videos. So um, I'll post uh, videos of all of my CS lectures. Um, so the one from this morning is already posted. Um, but the first few lectures here, um, first few videos here, these are general information. Um, this is for how to use something called the Q&A system for this class, which we'll do before class ends today. Um, this is for installing a Linux system on top of Windows or a Mac. This is for customizing PuTTY if you use PuTTY to access the server. Um, so these are, are general information, but all of your class lectures will, um, will appear down here. Um, And as we we move forward, um, so so these lectures are are time stamped. So if you go to the description, you'll see when different things occur. So we talked about Linux access down here, 34 minutes into the course. Access. There we go. Um, and so you can you can click through to. to a page that'll show you the, the timestamps for all the lectures and, and um, so anyway, um, that'll make more sense when we get more lecture material up. Um, if we do code during class, I'll post snippets to it here. Um, and there's nothing there right now. Discord server, so this will bring you to a invite for the Discord server. Um, Discord is not an official sanctioned part of this course, okay? I, I did not seek nor get permission from the school to use a Discord server. Um, we're, we're basically flying under the radar, which means I'm not policing this, I'm not monitoring it. If you ask a question in here with my name, right, I'll get a notification, I can answer it. But this is really a resource for the students, okay? So there's a 224 general. Um, Go ahead and sign up if you want. It can be a good place to sort of interact with one another, ask questions. And in the past, what I've seen is is a lot of people helping each other. And that's useful, you know, if you're struggling to understand something, somebody else might be able to explain it to you. If you help somebody else, that will help your understanding of a subject too, right? When you try to explain how to parse command line arguments to somebody, that really builds your understanding. Okay, so that, that can be useful. Um, so 224 general is, is the general one for this course. General is just kind of a general Discord channel that, that most people don't do a lot with. If you want to do memes and stuff, go to Segfault. Okay, that's just out there for, you know, whatever people want to do. Um, but again, I don't, I don't police this. I don't monitor it. If, it. if it starts, you know, getting abused, I'll, I'll just shut it down. Um, because I don't have time and wherewithal to to monitor it and control it, but play nice and and you know it's it's a useful resource in general. So that's a Discord server. Um, let's talk about your homework. So homework one is posted, and it's it's a basically uh, kind of a pulse check, just sort of getting up to speed. So I'm not going to download it again because I've already downloaded it. So here's your first homework assignment. I think this is due on Wednesday uh, morning. So four steps. First one, log into the Linux server. Um, change your password. Log back in. Run the answer program. That's the second step. Third step, send me an email on the Linux server and then log out. And you get your, I think, 10 points for that. So let's go through these steps in, in the 10 minutes we have left. Um, there is a um, how-to guide that you can find online. Um, it's on Canvas, but I'll bring it up here. So the first thing is logging into the server. All right, so the server's name is linux.engrcs.com. Your username is your first initial followed by your last name. So for example, if my name is Tom Smith, my username is T Smith. It's not the same login name as your CTEC ID. 
There's no period, there's no number after the end, there's no punctuation. Unless you have a hyphen in your last name on Canvas, then the hyphen would be there. So as your name appears in Canvas, first initial, last name. Your password is your nine-digit CTC link ID followed by an underscore. So if, if that's your ID, that's your initial password. The first time you log in, it'll ask you to change your password. It'll do it as follows. It'll ask you for your current password and then ask you for a new password twice. So we'll do that shortly. Accessing the server. From Windows, you can access it using PuTTY, if that's what you like doing in, in 121. That will still work. If you're on a Linux machine or a Mac, you can use SSH. If you're on Windows 10, you can drop into a DOS shell and still do SSH. Um, so let me do this using SSH just because it's, it's sort of the more Unix-y way to, um, to get into a server. So I'm going to do SSH. So let's say my name is, is Susan User. So my username will be suser at linux.engrcs.com. You may get a message the first time you do this about uh, a fingerprint ID that's in the how-to. You can go ahead and say yes, accept it. Okay, it's asking me for my current password. That would be my nine-digit CTC link ID followed by an underscore. And if I get that password correct, it will tell me, you know, welcome to the system. Warning, your password has expired. You must change your password. First thing it wants, my current password. This is not the new one yet. This is the same password I just typed to log in. And then it wants a new password. If I don't type the same password twice, it'll say passwords don't match. And it logs me out. Okay, you have to notice that because if I think it changed my password and I try to log in, it's not gonna log me in with that new password. It's still expecting the old password. And if I type in the wrong password, it'll it'll ask me again, right? So this is my CTC link ID followed by an underscore. And now I put in my new password and put the same password in twice. Yep, I messed up. All right, put in my old password. All right, so now I have to put in my old password again, and then put in my new password, and then put in my new password again. All right, now my password has changed, and you know that because it says successfully changed. So now you log in with your new password, and you're good to go. All right, so that's step one and two, step one of your, your homework. Step two, run the answer program. Okay, what is answer? Just say answer, enter, and it'll say I'm waiting for a question from the teacher. I've already got a question posted there. So what's the question? Well, it's not really a deep question. It says welcome to the Q&A system. You'll, you'll use this tool to answer questions during lecture for now. This is just a quest, test question. What is your favorite color? And I can say something like, you know, what is a color anyway? Doesn't matter what you type, okay? Any answer will work. I can either click on the submit button. I find it faster to just hit a tab so submit is highlighted and then hit the enter key or a space key. And that's it. I've submitted my, my answer. Okay, we're going to use this during class in general to be able to, to have me post questions to you and have you answer them. We'll play around with that more later this week. When you're done with this, the way you get out of it is control C, okay? And this is, this is a first thing to make sure you're clear on. Control C is used to stop a program. It's used to interrupt a program. Control Z, as in zebra, is not what you want to use. That does not actually terminate a program. It pauses it. It suspends it. So if I'm running the answer program and I answered my question and I want to leave, I can do control C. All right, so that's the second part. The last part of the email is to send me, the uh, last part of the homework is to send me an email on the server. So um, 
there's a mail system in the Linux server, and you can send a message by just saying mail space and the name of the person you want to send to. Now you can't send outside the server, and this is not how you generally want to get a hold of me. You want to use nmacias at clark.edu from your regular mailer. But on the Linux server, if you want to send me a direct message, you can just say mail Nick. Subject, um, this is a test. And then you can type in whatever message you want. And when you're done, either hit a control D or hit a period by itself. It says EOT that says I'm done. I've sent the message. So send me a test message. And that's the last part of your homework. All right, so everybody should try to do this either right now or, you know, in the next few minutes or certainly sometime today. Um, there's nothing you have to submit or turn in on Canvas, right? All of this stuff happens um, on the Linux server. And I'll go in, I'll make sure everybody's answered the question, I'll make sure I've got an email from everybody. And, um, and then we're good to go. All right, any questions on any of that? Okay, um, so send me an email and, and tell me that, and I will send you back your exact login information just to confirm it, and we'll go from there. And I got about a half hour for my next class, so if you do that right after class, we should be able to get that taken care of. Cool. All right, any other questions? All right, awesome. I will let you out um, 60 seconds early. I will see you either in 2.15 at 12.30 or I'll see you um, tomorrow at 11 o'clock in 2.24. All right, thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Have a good one. Thanks.